discussing counting all things lost, and our leader today will be our youth pastor, Reverend William Curry. He had already done his homework last week, so I see. <laughs> so let us receive Reverend Curran at this time. <laughs> Do you need this? Oh, yeah. Test, test, okay. Good morning, everyone. Good to see everyone's faces on this morning as we uh, journey into God's Word for our Sunday school hour. Good morning to our online and our Facebook live viewers as well. It's just a good day to be in God's house once again. The second Sunday in December, uh, we're getting closer and closer. I believe we're 15 days away from Christmas. I hope Santa brought you all or is going to bring you all everything that you want this year. And uh, I believe he showed me his list a little early, and I saw a few of you all on the naughty list, so yeah, uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Amen. And so uh, we are glad to be in the uh, Lord's house um, on this morning. Uh, before we journey into the word, uh, allow us to uh, bow for a word of prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you and we love you. We praise your name. Lord, we ask for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, we ask that as we are studying and viewing your word, Lord, we ask that you open up our minds to receive something new, to impart into someone else. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word becoming flesh and dying on the cross to save us from our sins. So we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name that we do pray, amen. amen. And this week we find ourselves in Philippians chapter 3. Um, and Sister Moore here is right. I did do my homework prematurely last week. I, I did two lessons. And uh, so I should, I should know this lesson from front to back, side to side, up and down. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3 verses 7 through 21. Um, as far as introduction serves, um, the first thing we have to know, we have to know, uh, I have a question, who is the writer or the acclaimed writer of Philippians? Can anyone tell us that? Paul. Paul is the acclaimed writer of Philippians. And a couple of questions that I have, um, does anyone know anything about Paul? Does anyone? Sister Joanne? He was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee, okay. He was an athlete. He was a... An athletic person. Okay, an athletic person. All right. Anything else that they know about Paul? He was a prideful person. Prideful, okay. He was in prison. He was in prison, all right. So those are a few things that we know about Paul. We know... Uh, from previous letters, or we know from Acts or Romans, that Paul was a persecutor of Christians. Yeah. All right? He persecuted Christians. He uh, had a agenda against Christians or those who served God. He had an agenda against the Jews. Uh, something else that a lot of people don't know, Paul talks about in the earlier books or early, earlier letters, uh, that he is born from a certain family, a certain religious family. His mother and his father, what do you think they are? Rachel and Jacob. His, his mother and father. What, what, are, what are they? What, they're, Jews. they're Jews. Good job. So his mother, he's born to a Jewish family, and, but we see that he is a persecutor of Christians. Um, something else that we see about Paul, Paul, in writing this letter to the church of Philippi, he is in prison during this time. Last week we learned that Paul was in prison. Uh, in last week's lesson, if I could go back into the scripture, he says, for me to live, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But he also says, although I'm in this down and out situation, I'm parenthetically speaking, although I'm down and out in this situation, seemingly, I still charge you to live for Christ. I still charge you that even though it may seem like my spirit is down, 
from a uh, not so great situation, I am still hopeful. I am still a certain that God, for God I live and for God that I do die, and God makes no mistakes. Even though I see that I am innocent, God is still taking care of me. And so he's still, he's charging the church of Philippi to know that in, in, throughout any situation, God is taking care of them. And so here we are, we've landed at chapter 3, where talk, Paul talks to the church of Philippi. And if we go on to the next slide, uh, rather the second slide, it says Paul commended, Paul commended the Philippians for many good aspects of their lives. But in this letter, he also challenged them to press on to become something better. And so uh, we're going to learn those aspects that Paul is trying to teach or trying to convey to the church of Philippi. So we can get someone to read verses 7 through 11 for us. But, but what the... It's on, it's on, Sister John. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things to be lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Amen. So the first thing we see uh, talks about in this, uh, in Philippians chapter 3, this first por por uh, portion is striving for excellence. All right? uh, when someone is striving, they're making an effort towards something great. Uh, Paul, he's trying to tell the church of Philippi, he's trying to church, tell the church of Philippi to strive towards the goal it is in Christ. And he basically is telling them to strive to be better. Now, I believe that Paul is trying to tell the church of Philippi because it's something different from this letter to Philippians than it is from some other letters. The difference in, in the, this letter to the church of Philippi, Paul does not write in resentment. He does not write this letter to chastise them, but he writes this letter to the church of Philippi to tell them all the good works that they're doing all the good works that they're performing as being the church, how they're not being false teachers, how they're not being slanderers of the gospel, how they're not, how they're not uh, being evildoers or having uh, bad or mal hearts. He's telling them that they are doing good and to keep the faith, but he's also telling them in the middle of this, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. New International Version says, what is more I consider what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost everything. He said, for, and also he says to go on that New International Version, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. And so Paul is trying to convey to the church of Philippi those past experiences or those past achievements that I got before it means nothing now that I have gained God in my life. And so the question is, could we say the same things? Do we put away the past things, the past achievements, the past goals, uh, the, the, the past highlights of life to say, Lord, I take you on and I put that under my feet or I place that right in my past and keep you as my vital focus? Because he's saying right there he's finding true gain. His true gain is putting those old things behind him and setting his eyes on God. 
And that's the question today as the 21st century church. Can we put the old things behind us and still focus on God? So not only that, but church, but Paul writes this letter to the church of Philippi. He does not write it to them because they're having community issues. He, he writes to them to tell them how much of a great job that they're doing. But he also writes to them to not stay in a place of complacency. Can somebody tell me what that word complacent means? Comfortable. Comfortable. Comfortability. All right. And so a lot of us know that when you are in a comfortable state, it is easy to go backwards. Uh, I, I relate this story the other day in, in talking about this. Um, I related it to uh, going to the gym. So uh, about three, four months ago, um, I was heavy in the gym and I was doing all the right things, Sister Steele, and I was uh, working out every day. I worked on a different muscle. I said, okay, I'm going to work on biceps and back to today and the next day I'm going to work on legs Sister Moorhead and then after that I'm going to work on my triceps and after that I'm going to get my cardio in it and so every day I did this constant thing and I kept seeing results and I kept uh, uh, I kept looking at myself Sister Joy in the mirror I said oh my god looking I'm looking good I'm doing the right I started eating the right things doing the right things but it wasn't until I started looking at myself so much and then, after one day of, of missing the gym, I said, oh, I'll miss this one day. Then one day turned into a week. Then a week turned into a month. And then a month turned into two months. And then I started to see that I fell into this place of complacency because I thought I already made it. But in order to keep up something good, you have to keep working at it. You have to keep striving at it. And so that's what Paul is telling the church of Philippi. Don't get complacent. Don't get lazy. Don't think that you made it already because you have so much further to go. And here it is applied to our spiritual life. Just because you've overcome one battle doesn't mean you cannot overcome another. Let's relate it. Let's, let's relate to a spiritual relate. I, I'll give a little funny joke to it. If you say if you work on yourself, I'm not going to cuss nobody out <laughs> every day. And then you say, but on Tuesdays, <laughs> whatever Tuesday comes, that's when I'm going to give somebody peace of my mind. But then Tuesdays roll over, well, I don't think Wednesday that bad because Wednesday somebody made me mad too. And then you start to fall back into bad habits. You got complacent with, okay, I'll just do it on Tuesdays. But then it became an everyday thing. And so then Paul is talking to the church of Philippi. He says in verse 10, that I may know him. And this is finding true intimacy with God. In living this spiritual life, we can, we, God gives us the strength. He gives us the power to work on our own, to strive after successes within God, to strive after life successes. But he has to remind, but there is a reminder that none of this is possible without God. And so Paul, he talks to the church of Philippi, and his, his gospel message is a three-point view. It's God-centered, it's Christ-exemplified, and then it's Christian-imitated. And so verse 10 it says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made comfortable unto his death. There's, I said something uh, on last Sunday. I said there's a difference in between calling the Lord and knowing the Lord. Amen. Because I could call his name and not have relationship with him. But when I find true intimacy with God and seek after his righteousness... Then I may know him and understand something. We know a lot of people know who Jesus is and know that he died on the cross. But do you know the reason? And some people may say, yes, he died for my sins. But the true reason is because he delivered us from sin. The stain of sin. So we see we're striving for excellence in chapter 3. 
verse 7 through 11, verse 11, it concludes in saying, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead, New International Version, it says, it's like, says it like this, and so somehow attain to the resurrection from the dead, which means that I am understanding that not only did Christ die and resurrect, but from his resurrection, I was resurrected as well. We were resurrected. And so as we go on to the next slide, or the next point, it talks about striving with exertion. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. And someone can read uh, verse 12 through 16 for us. Not as though I had already obtained, either were already perfect, but follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. Verse 15 and 16. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus, mind, thus minded, that if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already obtained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same things. Amen. So the next point we see is striving with exertion. Exertion is this word that is identified as the application of a force or influence of quality. Simply, this word exertion means action. And so uh, I've, I, I've said or I've um, related before when I was growing up, my mother would always say, always say to me, son, hand service is better than lip service. And I would never, I could not understand what she meant. She would say hand service is better than lip service. And then as I grew older, the meaning of that is showing someone is better than telling someone. And so many times in this Christian life, God understands us in our human flaw, but God also wants us to be better. He wants us to strive. He wants to exert our energy towards it. He wants us to put action towards it, put focus on it. Because many times when, when we have been in life situations or we have found ourselves in the shambles or, or the tribulation or trials of life and we ask God, God, if you get me out of this, I promise I'll do the right thing. I'll go to church. Matter of fact, I'll be the first one at the church. I'll go to Bible study. Matter of fact, I'll be the first one at Bible study. And matter of fact, I'll have every different version of the Bible that you need me to have. But when God sees that we're putting action to it rather than just saying it, if we're going to be better Christians, we can't just say, uh, we can't qu just quote, love thy neighbor. We have to actually do it. We can't say, that's not covered. We have to ha actually have to do it. But notice this. this the, the main word that, that is the focus and focal point of the lesson is striving. Striving, again, is making an effort towards it. Making some type of measurable action towards whatever the goal is or whatever the goal is set upon your life, whatever it is that you may struggle with in temptation or sin or trying to be better in, make an effort towards it. And striving is ongoing. Striving <laughs> is ongoing. Yeah. It, it, and, and, and so <clears throat> it brings back to that place of not being complacent but trying to be better. The Church of Philippi, Paul had no... He had, he had no wrong things to say about them. He had no bad things to say about them. But he tells them, in doing good, be better. And so, striving 
with exertion, it takes action. Not only that, but it says here, the focus, the focus verse of the lesson says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, it says, And I call all things but lost for the, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, whom I have suffered and do not count them but dung, but as garbage that I may win Christ. Then verse 14 says, but I press towards the mark. Meaning that I put all those things behind me and I keep pressing towards what is ahead of me. To put that into action, when you're driving in the car, you can't look in the rearview mirror the whole time while you drive. I wouldn't advise you to, at least. But when you're driving, you have to look what? Ahead. You have to look not only at the, at the, the light that's coming up, but the next light after that. You have to look at the cars around. You have to look at everything that's ahead of you. Because if I focus on everything that's behind me, eventually what's going to happen? I'm going to run into somebody, something, crash, mess my car up. And so this is the same scenario in our spiritual minded car. We have to stay focused on whatever the goal is set before us in God. If I have a problem, if I have an addiction, if I have a shortcoming, my, my focus is to get past it, and to grow further in God. Striving towards it. Because here it is, Paul talks about this Christ imitation. We to, are, are to live like Christ, not to be Christ, because there is only one Christ. There is only one perfect being that came down from heaven and put on the garments of flesh and died for our sins and rose again. There is only one person that has done that. So join. And our credentials <clears throat> means nothing in comparison with the kingdom of God. So it doesn't matter all the degrees and whatever we have. That has no bearing mm -hmm. in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Our credentials do not matter. Because what God looks at us, God looks at all of us the same right. as a servant. It's not about all that, it, all that you've done, all the, the and not to, not to devalue any of those things. All of those things are good. I, I look at myself sometimes and I see how far God has brought me, but I also see how far he has brought me in, a, in an educational world or, or in, in the public world, but I also see how far he's brought me spiritually. The things that I used to do, I don't do no more. The things that used to excite me, they just don't excite me anymore. But I also see how much further God can bring me. And notice this. Paul, and, 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 and <laughs> I, I just find this a little funny, that Paul, in, 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 the, uh, in the lesson of the book, it talks about how Paul, in saying this, he does, not, he does not say this for others, but he focuses on self. He charges others to press towards the, uh, the mark of the high calling of Christ Jesus, but he does not say, worry about the next person doing it too. I do this, I do this with my students. Uh, I, do, I put a hashtag in front of something, and then they say it. So I'm going to say, hashtag, stay in your lane. I can't worry about what everybody else is doing. I can't say, you know what, you're not living for God, and then not look at myself. Because a lot of times, sometimes, when we're looking at others' journey, we're not focused on our own. Then I'm not pressing towards the high mark that God is trying to get me to. Verse 15, so it talks about reaching forward, reaching forward 
towards that goal, reaching, pressing upward, looking up to what God has for you, or looking up to that goal that you're trying to achieve within your spiritual lifestyle, then walking onward. He says, nevertheless, where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Verse 16 in the New International Version says, only let us live up to what we have already attained. And so, with striving with exertion, it takes action, it takes some focus, it takes some maturity, it takes some focus on individuality, it also takes knowing that I have better to look forward to. Or I have to work on myself to be better. And the other day when I was talking to, to, to this uh, Bible study, I said, I think this is uh, also uh, God's spiritual and physical, spiritual word for me to be better, for us to be better, but physical word for me to get back in that gym. <laughs> Amen. So we'll go on to the next slide. After we see that we strive for excellence, strive with exertion, the last thing we see, Paul talks about the church of Philippi, striving and expectation. If we can get someone to uh, read verses 17 through 21. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mine earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Amen. And so, in striving the expectation, verse 17 through 21, Paul talks about following a good pattern. Verse 17, he says, Join together and follow my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. So he's basically saying unto them, this model that I've given you, take it for yourself. These instructions, these biblical instructions, because uh, Paul also says, even when I do want to do right, what he says always amongst them, evil is always against them. So pressing on towards the mark does not mean I won't have some setbacks. But when I press towards something, even though I have some setbacks, don't let that keep you back. So, Joanne. And pressing towards the mark is putting Christ first. Amen. Because if I allow that thing to keep me back, I'll never get to what I'm trying to get to. If I want to be better at something, I have to keep practicing. I have to keep working on it so that I could be better. Here it is, I'll tell you all secret. Don't tell nobody else, please. Keep this between us. Online, keep this between us. God wants you to be better. And by God wanting you to be better, he has better in store for you. But you have to press towards the mark. You have to walk towards it, focus on it, you have to, to realize it. In the, in the previous verses, it's, uh, verse 10 says that I may know him. Verse 14, it says to, to, that I may be focused on the high prize of the calling of God in Christ Jesus. Verse 17, it says that I may see the example that's going on and focus afterwards. Because it is easy to get distracted. Distraction is easy. I relate it back to me being in the gym. When I, get out, when I got out of the gym, Sister Steele, 
I would smell. I don't, I don't know why, so I, I, I could tell a little bit about myself. I'd go to, uh, uh, what, what's the name of the job? I, I ain't been in there so long, I forgot my gym name. Uh, it's not Planet Fitness. Um, either way, the gym is Maryville. It's on US 30. It'll come to my mind. So US 30, right across from the gym, Portillo's, <laughs> White Castle, Panera Bread. Right next door to the gym is uh, the Catch 30. All right. Right, right on the counter corner of the gym, a Dunkin' Donuts and, and Panda Express. And so I have all these distractions and smell all these things and say, hmm, you know what? It won't hurt to have that cheeseburger just this one time. But then as I fall, as we fall, as I fall into complacency, I begin to see my setback has now placed me back further than what I'm trying to get to. Dancing with sin is fun, but sin can set you back. Noticing that there is sin is no problem at all. But also noticing that I don't have to stay in my sin is what God is trying to get us to be. We don't have to practice it. We have to practice it. It's not easy. It's not easy at all. But you have to work. You have to press toward that mark. First thing, the next thing we see, following a bad pattern, says, verse 18 and 19, for as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their, their destiny is destruction, their God is in their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mindset is on earthly things. If I keep my mind on the things that I hear, if I'm always carnal-minded and not spiritual-minded, then that means I'm not focused on God. That I'm not allowing God to be God and God all by himself. I'm putting other things before him. So this is forsaking a bad pattern. It says in the book, it says the Philippians, like Christians today, have to choose what pattern to follow. On the one hand, they could follow the example of Paul, Timothy, and Epaphroditus, who is also a member of the church of, of Philippi. But on the other hand, there were also people who were enemies of the Christ, cross of Christ. And so by Christ dying on the cross for us and, and we are confessing our sins, but also um, giving into him our salvation, surrendering unto him um, our full submission, we are now friends of Christ. So that forsakes a bad pattern. We have, we have noticed that we don't want to just live this earthly life, but we want to put Christ as the head of our lives. And then last, we're focusing on of the best pattern. Verses 20 through 21, it says, But our citizenship, citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord, Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. So Paul gives them a heavenly, he gives them a heavenly thing to look towards. That you, that even though you are imperfect down here, Christ will transform you, configure you to be perfect. Once he sees your strides down here. We strive towards the mark that God is trying to get us to. Here's a reminder. It's not easy. Here's a reminder, it's going to take some work. But the good news is that when we keep God as the head of our lives, it gets easier. When you realize that your setback is only a setback, but every, with every good setback, there's a good comeback. 
some of the best races, some of the best races that you can see is a relay race, where you see one of the, one of the uh, team members, they may not be as far as the other team, but when they pass the baton off to the next team member, something great could happen. And so on this spiritual race and spirituality and in being sovereign with the Savior and striving for excellence, we are to put our best foot forward, noticing that God is ahead of us. Christ is behind us. Goodness is on one side. Mercy is on the other. And with all of that help and beneficiaries, there is no possible way to of them failing, and to wholeheartedly trust God. Amen. Amen. All right, I guess I'll teach uh, next Sunday's lesson as well. <laughs> so we just, <laughs> I'm on a roll. Yes, yes. All right, this, this is one of my, Philippians is one of my favorite books. Amen. So uh, I guess I'll teach that now since we don't, right? Sister Moore here, I can teach it now. I got about 10 minutes. No. <laughs> Amen. But on, uh, not next Sunday, but fourth Sunday, correct? For, for, because we're not having Sunday school next week? We're going to have some. Okay. So for next week, we're going to be in our lesson, Leaning Contentment in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 18. Uh, we thank God for our lesson today, Counting All Things Lost. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 21. Uh, thank you for, to our online and Facebook Live viewers as we get ready to go into our early morning worship. Uh, allow us, are there, are there any questions, uh, comments before we um, dismiss? I made a note to myself that not to compare myself with others just because I go to Sunday school. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Amen. All right, anyone else? Yes, ma'am. That was reminding myself, too, not to be complacent. It's so easy to stay complacent and stagnant. Amen. Allow us to pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through, through 21. God, as we have opened up our minds to what your word has said, open up our hearts so that we may embrace it. God, we thank you for your word, God. We thank you for your word made flesh. God, we ask that as we go into our morning worship, God, that you be here, that you rest through the body, that your spirit lives in us and, and, and abides in us, oh God. Lord, right now, we ask for your comfort and your peace. We thank you for the online viewers. We thank you for those that are on their way to the sanctuary, those that are pressing their way towards here now. Lord, we ask that you make us better Christians, better believers, God, be better faith dwellers. In the mighty name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen.